Uh, Richard Martin is the one that usually greets you guys as you come in. I'll give him a moment to do that uh, shortly, but I, I want to just say that I am excited that we have been able the last couple of years to regularly bring some amazing webinars, webinars on homiletics, social justice. We've done a number of webinars on um, evangelism and church growth and discipleship, and we intend to do the exact same thing in 2022. Um, we really believe in self-development. Helen White says, it's our first duty toward God and our fellow beings, that of self-development. Self-development is our first responsibility. And um, these webinars represent our attempt to just elevate that in the minds of pastors and non-pastors across this nation. Want to let you know that the next webinar that we will be conducting will be the 16th of this month. The 16th of this month we will be doing a webinar and it will be for pastors. And it's entitled, What Pastors Need to Know About Pastoring Right Now. We're not talking about preaching primarily. We're not talking about administration primarily. All those things will be discussed, but we're talking about shepherding. What are those things that we need to understand as shepherds as we move through this new normal? But that will be uh, January the 16th. You'll hear a little bit more about that as we close tonight's webinar out, but I don't want to delay tonight. We are excited to have Dr. Calvin Rock, Dr. Calvin Rock, administrator, evangelist, pastor, university president, author. They say that the only blemish on his otherwise pristine record is that he baptized me years ago. That's what the rumor is. He baptized <laughs> But I'm so glad that he's with us tonight. He is one of the contributors to a very important quarterly that you will hear described shortly. Along with Dr. Rock, we have the best uh, hosts. We have Dr. Timothy Nixon, my good friend, who has recently been made the senior pastor of the Ephesus Southern Adventist Church in uh, the Northeastern Conference, and then Richard Martin. Richard Martin has been moderating these webinars. I mean, he's had interviews with everyone from the likes of Alan Waller, from Cynthia Hale to others, a rising young preacher in the Allegheny East Conference there in Hampton, Virginia. We're excited that he's here tonight. Listen, I got to get out of your way. I'm excited that you're here. Richard, it's on you, my brother. You guys have a great evening. Hey, thanks, Doc Wilson. Again, let me just say good evening to you, our brothers and sisters. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be able to engage one another in your presence as we talk about the upcoming quarterly Social Justice and the Word of God, edited by Drs. Mervyn Warren and Calvin Rock. And as has been said, we have Dr. Rock with us and Dr. Timothy Nixon. I have my eyes here on the Zoom chat and on Facebook for your questions to come forward. And we want to dive right in. We have competent and consecrated and capable panelists tonight. And it's my privilege, along with Dr. Nixon, to just fire some questions at you, Dr. Rock, and have a conversation together. Uh, let's start here. We have this quarterly that's coming out, beautifully designed, contributed to by Dr. Pedrito Maynard Reed, Dr. Hyveth Williams, Dr. Leslie Pollard, and Dr. Ricardo Graham. Uh, we wanna ask, what's the genesis of this study guide? Where does it come from? Where does, from where does the idea emerge? How did we get here? Thank you, and um, kudos to you, gentlemen, for what you're doing, what you have done, and uh, the future that I understand that you're, you're looking toward. It's great. It's great. I have to confess that this is my first time visiting with you, but I promise it won't be the last time. All right. <laughs> and, uh, I, I'm, I'm excited about more about what I hear you're doing than about what I'm presenting, but thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, uh, while I was working at Oakwood, I was employed there for 14 years. And uh, Dr. Warren and I were big buddies then, and we still are. And we said, no, nah, you know, one of these days, we're going to have to write something together. He likes yeah. to write, I like to write. As you know, Dr. Warren is an accomplished author. And by the way, he's just finished a book with Pacific Press 
on the preaching and life of Gardner Taylor. Mm. I'll throw that in, give him a little prop <laughs> right there. But we've always been fellows who like to write. We Ooh. like to write. And I used to tell him, Merv, you and I have got to do something together one of these days. Now, of course, I've been away from Oakwood, what, 35, 36 years. Mm -hmm. So it never happened. But the idea cropped up about doing this, this Sabbath school quarterly study guide for Black History Month. And we talked about it and decided we would do this. Not that we would write it ourselves, but we collaborate, work together, and get the best we could to put it in, in writing and produce it. So we did. We talked about it, decided we'd try it. We got the people that you've named and ran it through the regional caucus. And they loved it, endorsed it. And in fact, each of the presidents took orders and it's on the way now. The boxes were mailed on yesterday. So the conferences, not only the regional conferences, but the two offices of the Pacific Union, mm -hmm. where our regional coordinators are housed, will be getting what they ordered in a few days. And from there, they'll be shipped out to the various conference offices from where they will be shipped to the churches in whatever allocations the presidents have decided. All right. Thank you so much. Jack Nixon? Well, well, you, you, you said something that kind of perked my ears up. You, you said Sabbath school quarterly guide. And so I'm wondering, uh, some may feel that this guide will be competing with the regular Sabbath school lesson. So, so, so how do you see this guide relating no, to Sabbath school lesson? How do you envision well, it being? We, we, we um, hope there'll be some righteous competition, but we don't want to replace the general conference study guide. We don't want to be accused of trying to wipe out whatever the general conference has planned for that month. So we hope that both will be studied. I don't know how they can both be studied at the 11 o'clock or the 9.30 hour, whatever time Sabbath school is in that local community, but we hope that it will be prominent and because it's different and because it's special and because it speaks to Black History Month, I think it will probably take preeminence, mm. but we don't want it to wipe the other one out. Or we don't want the other to be dropped. Maybe one will have to be studied in the afternoon. Uh, I don't know how some might want to do it on a Sunday, but both should be studied. But by all means, this is special, never done before. If it works well, we, we'll, we'll do it again. In fact, he and I are already talking about Juneteenth. Mm. Juneteenth, producing okay. another one for June. Uh, but that hasn't been organized as yet. But it simply says to answer your question that we feel that it needs to be prominent and perhaps have preeminence, but not to replace the regular quarterly or the regular study guide. I'm dating myself when I call it a quarterly, the regular study guide <laughs> for the month of February, Black History yeah, Month. Yeah. Yes, you, you are quite dating yourself calling it a quarterly. That's, <laughs> that's, old, that's old terminology. I so, 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 so actually you're saying that perhaps during Black History Month, you, you do envision perhaps it being used during that month. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, in, 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 in place of, or, 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 or I guess at the very least, uh, 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 sort of concomitant to the Sabbath school lesson, maybe in the afternoon, Sabbath afternoon, or perhaps maybe uh, for, for maybe, maybe, maybe small group studies that month, or maybe, maybe Wednesday night prayer meeting series or Absolutely. something like that. But, but use it especially during uh, Black History Month. Yeah, and of course, it is um, expressed in such a way that it can be studied later in later months as well. It's a real keepsake. It's a real keepsake and it's a valuable package of dynamite information. It's not hostile. It doesn't try to burn down the building. <laughs> it's not militant, but it's direct. And uh, maybe in some people's minds, radical, 
mm-hmm. but nothing that should disturb the saints in an unrighteous way. And I hope that it will take preeminence. I think I can say that truthfully, and it should, because it's special, and it speaks to that. It speaks to that month, as the quarterly does not usually do so. But it shouldn't. It shouldn't uh, put it on the shelf at all. They both should be studied. You know, as we are following along in this conversation, I just want to let those who are listening and watching know that these study guides are available for purchase even now. You can visit Advent Source and find them there. The links will be placed in our Zoom chat and in our Facebook chat as we proceed in conversation. And so that persons have an idea of the categories that have been addressed in this first installment, you have social justice and the Old Testament, social justice and the ministry of Jesus, social justice and the book of Revelation, and social justice and Ellen White. So just that we have some language to attach to this conversation for those who are just being introduced to it, and even for those who are already somewhat familiar, we'll place the links there in the chat. Um, Dr. Rock, I wanted to ask you, how did you all come to, uh, we know that gathering writers and researchers is one thing, but then kind of the cutting board, the editing room, how did you come to these four focal points? The Old Testament, the ministry of Jesus, Revelation, and Ellen White's ministry. One thing that drove us in this direction or guided us in this direction was seeking people who have researched in these areas or whose scholastic productions have touched on the subject of Mm. social justice. And uh, we found, as we thought through the matter and talked to a number of people, one or two writers who may be used later on because they are proficient and they are well-versed in other areas or in other phases of this topic, because whatever we do will, in the future, God willing, will have to do with social justice. But we wanted to put together a package where we could mate the topics and coordinate written by people who had thought in various manners with this regard or in this regard. So we tested the waters and found the people who didn't have to begin with, with nothing. These are, each of these persons has thought and either written or preached or more likely written mm-hmm. in, in this way or had a part of their dissertation or part of their thesis that dealt with what they put together in the lesson. And we helped to contour it and nurture it and nuance it so that they all fit together. Right. Awesome. I'm glad to know, and I'm sure that there are those listening who are glad to know that, again, this wasn't random selection, you know, who do we know simply, but who really has by way of experience, study, research, can make an honest contribution so that as it is exposed to our church, and I would even imagine as anything that is written, you and I, the three of us were talking beforehand, whatever you write is kind of out there for anyone who accesses it. So it's good that we have persons who are investing in this way. Um, Chad Nixon, over to you. Now, now you, you did select some very broad significant themes. And so I'm wondering, for example, in the Old Testament, how, how deeply are they able to deal with some of these issues such as the children of Israel and the Egyptian bondage, the Sabbath, Israel as an immigrant nation, economic justice, social yeah. equity, gender equity. How, how deeply were they actually able to, to get into some of, those, um, some of those issues in dealing with um, something like um, social justice and the Old Testament? Well, of course, you know, since each one has one week, they couldn't give it all. But your question is very, very pertinent. Um, Pedrito Maynard Reed, Dr. Reed at Walla Walla, who is the only Black THD that Mm -hmm. I know of. In fact, the only THD doctor of theology uh, that I know of, period. I'm sure there must be some others in the church but he is as well or better prepared than anybody, dealt with it um, 
by dealing first of all with social justice in the writings of Moses and in, in the works of the children of Israel. And then he went to Proverbs and to Psalms. And he also worked with a few of the minor and major prophets in the Old Testament. But as I said, with only the days of Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, really to substantively get into the issue, uh, I must say that there's more to be said, but what I was delighted with, not only in his writings, but the others as well, is that they came up or they have produced for us new understandings mm. with a lot of scriptures that we've read, not casually perhaps, but mm. not understanding thoroughly uh, the depth of, of connections that righteousness has with social justice. Mm. And they did a wonderful job of bringing that out. You know, Doc Rock, this, this, this may be a little later than it should have been, or may, might, maybe it's perfect timing. Would you provide for us maybe a working definition of social justice, just so that we kind of have something that anchors us when we talk about its connection with the word of God? Because when we mention those two terms, social justice, and then when we mention the next terms, the word of God, I think we all can agree people hear those terms differently. <laughs> so help us with some working definitions that kind of preempt us to these study guides. So when we come to it, we can kind of know here is the understanding of social justice and its inherent connection to the word of God. Yeah, we have a teacher's aid, a teacher's study aid mm -hmm. that uh, helps us here because we figured that would be one of the questions that would be asked and that we needed to answer. So let me read to you a line or two from, um, from that piece that will be sent out soon, I think by um, Advent Source, who is the publisher. And by the way, let me say, before we get too far along in this regard, that a vital part of this study guide is what we call the did you knows. In other words, at the beginning of every week, and the beginning of the week is the Sabbath that precedes the, the Sunday where the first lesson is unfolded. On that Sabbath in the preview of the week's lesson, we have begun that page mm -hmm. with eight different did you knows? Okay. Now these did you knows are simply uh, critical dates and events in the history of Black Adventism. Mm. So we're not dealing just with the biblical statements and uh, the biblical exegesis. We're also talking about in this commemorative memorial special study guide for Black History Month. We're also going to be giving for the reader, and many of our members have, well, you know, not many, few have been able to go to the seminary and get all that beautiful history mined out and placed on their plates. But mm. they will be here. We have 32 such statements in uh, the study guide, and that's another reason it becomes so important for distribution among our people. And by the way, and I'm going to answer your question, but mm -hmm. by the way, the study guide is dedicated to the Fordhams who perished right. in the fire. That's right. Dedicated to them and uh, the beautiful lives that they lived and the work that they did. Mm -hmm. All right. But back to, back to your question. Um, the study guide tells us that social justice is rightly seen, first of all, as a constituent element of God's loving character. Mm. It's not something we mine out and say, now here, this is a part of the gospel. It should be seen and understood as a constituent element of the character of God. Right. And that's where we have to begin. It's also defined rightly. It's also rightly defined as the application of fairness. Mm -hmm. 
It is defined as the application of fairness in all phases of personal and corporate relationships. It is fairness in all relationships, whether mm -hmm. they be corporate or personal. It is also defined in our work as the union of righteousness and justice in the Bible, justice of all kinds in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, that justice and righteousness are inseparable. Mm -hmm. They have been wed together, and it's only the conservative theologians who try to render asunder what God had put together. Yeah. God put them together, but conservative theologians and Adventism has been has not been blessed since its early days mm -hmm. with the more liberal kind. Now we're hearing more and more, thank God. But conservative Adventism has not been faithful in making that relationship clear. Um, there are other ways to look at it. Our teacher's guide also reminds the instructor that uh, social justice is not to be divorced from the mission of the church. Hmm. And it, one with us and with me personally, it's always been grievous to to hear and know and read and listen to conversations that seem to separate social justice from the work of the church or from the principles that the church should be preaching and teaching. And mm -hmm. if I might illustrate that, at the conclusion of the uh, GC in San Antonio in 2015, I wrote to one of our leading administrators and asked why the massacre of those nine worshiping Baptists in Charleston just two or three weeks prior to GC had not been mentioned during the general conference session. Wow. There was no prayer, no thought, no sympathy for the survivors or for the family of the deceased. And the answer mm -hmm. that I got from a very capable and influential leader was, we are here, we were there at the general conference in San Antonio to talk about the second coming and to get the church ready for the coming of Jesus and not to deal with political and social matters. Hmm. Have mercy. Which Have is mercy. a stark separation of what God had put together. And this is why this, this study guide is so important. It shows that they are together. And we take that definition, that understanding that justice in all of its aspects, not just social, but distributive, procedural, restorative, retributive, and compensatory. All mm. phases of justice are a part of what God is all about and should not be divorced from the work of the church. Yes, sir. Does that help? That helps tremendously. Okay. Thank you, Doc. So, 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 Doc, having said that, which, which is very, um, very comprehensive, do you believe then that our church should re-examine our understanding of what it means for us to be a prophetic church, the remnant church? We call ourselves the remnant church of Bible prophecy. Do you believe that this, this entire study guide will help us to perhaps re-examine what it means uh, when we call ourselves a prophetic church, what does that mean? Because, because we have sort of limited that to just foretelling the future, seeing ourselves as a prophetic church that just foretells the future. Mm. So, so, so do you think that, that we should really re-examine our understanding of what it means to be a prophetic church as the Seventh-day Adventist church? Absolutely. And these study guide lessons will emphasize that. We, we as a people have been priestly, but not as prophetic as we should have been. Wow. And uh, by that, I think I can also say that we have been very good about 
the therapeutic and the healing nature of the gospel. We're, we're great when it comes to putting on the tourniquets and the salving that helps to heal the wounded, but we have been very quiet about going after those robber barons who have set up the circumstances that bring the suffering and that are responsible for the injustices in Absolutely. society. And Absolutely. this is the prophetic work that the church needs to be about. It's what the prophets were about. Mm. You know, mm. you, you read Isaiah and, and thank God for Dr. Maynard Reed. He, he deals with it beautifully in the first lesson of the four. Isaiah crying out, speak for this widows, proclaim for those who are bound and yoked. And, uh, mm. it, 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 and it takes us back to what Jesus said in, 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 in Luke 4, that he came to, to break the yokes. Yes, sir. The fact is that before he talks about taking, his, taking our feet off the Sabbath, in Isaiah 58, there are three verses he talks about the Sabbath, as I recall. Mm. But all the other verses before then, he's talking about the kind of fast that he honors, taking care of the poor, breaking every yoke, Mercy. lifting the burdens, feeding the hungry, clothing the poor, and not just that alone, but as I said, seeing to it that these yokes are lifted and that the sources of evil, those mm. who are the creators of laws and rules, and circumstances that generate poverty and suffering and injustice are dealt with as well. And you know, Jesus did that. Now you didn't ask me to preach a sermon, so let me <laughs> go back, but you got me going on that one. Take your time. <laughs> this is the Jesus who took up a whip. Mm. This is a Jesus who took up a whip and said, you fools, you whited sepulchers, you dirty, no good. Well, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but that's what he was saying. And he went after the perpetrators, but mm. we have not done that. So much so that Nazi Germany had Seventh-day Adventist Christians who wouldn't say anything against Nazism because their mouths were closed because of conservative Adventist theology that said, in, in a word, we can be priestly with the healing, but we should not be prophetic with attacking the sources of evil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Rock, many persons have, and I would imagine still do, apply that line of reasoning to both Christ and to, say, Ellen White. There are those who would fight tooth and nail to say Ellen White was a proponent of as much separation between the church and speaking to social ills. Is that true? And is there any references? Are there any references in the study guides, in the teacher's guides that help us to wrestle with that question? Yes. In fact, um, Ricardo Graham, the recently retired president of my union out here, the Pacific Union, uh, wrote the final week for uh, the study guide, and he deals with that. The fact of the matter is that is a gross misunderstanding and uh, a gross misuse of Ellen White's writings and principles. She was out and outright a social apologist. She, she well, her whole, her whole genre of writings, if read carefully, mm. speak to social justice. She talks about social equality. You would even think in some of her writings that she's Marxist. And wow. she, she's almost, she sounds like a communist almost sometimes when she talks about the fact that God structured, and um, Dr. Graham brings this out in that final week, that God structured things in Israel so that there would be no social inequality. Wow. The whole economic structure of having the, the land rest every so many years. Hmm. And the poor being able to go out and gather whatever they needed and wanted. And the whole, the business, and Dr. Reed brings us out in the first week, the business of uh, everybody's debts being canceled, no matter how much you owe, the debts could be canceled after so many years. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that's the way capitalism worked? But Ellen White speaks to this kind of equality and the fact that 
and in Patriarchs and Prophets, she talks about the giving patterns of the people, which involve not only tithing, and Dr. Graham brings this out, but offerings that brought their financial contributions to 25%. Wow. And that all of that, which was over the 10% that took care of the Levites, took care of the poor and the needy. Have mercy. Awesome. And leveled, to a degree, leveled the ground. And uh, social inequality was distasteful, was dis and is distasteful to God, was then, is now, and it was for Ellen White. And she writes very profoundly about it. And the book, Southern Work, everybody ought to have Southern Work. Yeah. She not only writes profoundly against slavery and what happened in the years after slavery while she was alive, but she even says, she calls America so-called Christian nation. That's wow. a term she uses for America. This so-called Christian nation owes a debt of gratitude and restoration. T she's she was a, pro a proponent of reparations. Hmm. And one has only to read, one, one has only to read um, Southern Work. You don't have to go through all of our writings and find this. Just read Southern Work and volume nine, where she talks about these things. And it's very clear that uh, she was positive and uh, in her own way was a modern day prophet in this regard. Hmm. Awesome, thank you. Let, let, let me let me ask you this because there seems to be a disconnect between what Jesus said in Luke 4, 18 and 19 and how evangelical Christians today view Christianity. Um, there seems to be a, um, a consistent separation of Christ from social issues. Does, does the study guide address this issue of how there seems to be a difference and how evangelical Christians view Christ and social issues and how Christ's ministry actually is conveyed in the gospels and what he says in Matthew 24 and 25 related to how, how, how he will judge us in the last days of Earth's history, when, when he comes back, how we've treated the least of these. Does, 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 the, does the study guide address that issue? It does. It does very, very uh, poignantly, very crisply. Um, and it also tells why, or it, 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 it refers to and alludes to, and in some, case, some cases speaks rather clearly to the fact that the reason for this rendering asunder of social justice from righteousness and social justice from the work of the Adventist church. And let me pause before I forget it. Let me pause before I forget it. ADRA, I understand, is now adding a department of social justice. They're calling it a department of advocacy and uh, some other very strong language. I don't have all of the uh, the title before me, but I'm 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 just I'm just excited uh, for the first time in my long association in Adventism, there is a department. I wish we had a department of social concern in the general conference that was replicated in the divisions and unions and locals and churches, a department that deals with social justice, just like we have a department that deals with uh, religious liberty and so forth. But now ADRA is adding such a department and we ought to congratulate them for them for that and Percy, um, uh, mm. the, the, the PhD in political assignment, political, um, political science, who's a member of the church in uh, Washington, DC, is the one who is chosen, a black woman has been mm. chosen to head that department and mm. uh, it's it's a great great victory for the Adventist Church. But back to the main main point. Um, the main point that you've asked about is is this so? It is so. It is dealt with in the lesson studies, and it is alluded to 
the reason for it is alluded to, and that reason is that our theology has been given to us mainly by the advantage class. Yeah. And the advantage do not see social issues in the word of God through the same prism as do the disadvantaged. There's a great deal of difference between the way the advantaged look at the Exodus. They are interested in the age of the earth and who was Moses' mother and to whom were the pharaohs related and what was the history of the wagons and how many of Pharaoh's wagons got drowned, but that's not what the freedom authors and what the liberation writers talk about. Yes, they sir. talk about the poor pregnant woman who has having to make bricks without straw. Have mercy. They talk about the poor old man who had to haul mortar and climb up ladders and spent his life working in ways that brought him no mm -hmm. personal inurement. And it's just the difference between the view of the word of God that the advantaged have and the disadvantaged. And remember, Jesus was among the disadvantaged. He came in the lowest of the lowest rung mm -hmm. of uh, humanity. So he saw things from down up, not up down. And yeah. that was the difference between Jesus and the Pharisees. They looked at the things that they saw up here. Jesus was looking up and they were looking down. He took on our humanity. He was one of us. And uh, as I think the lessons will clearly show, uh, Elder Nixon, Pastor Nixon, that uh, you asked the question, that uh, this is the reason we have come through so many decades since early Adventism, when we were when we were outspoken, when we had our first general conference president who had been one of the purveyors of the uh, Underground Railroad, and when Ellen White and her husband James and when the other early authors wrote very strongly against slavery. Mm. We've come a long ways away from that, uh, that stringent, strident will to speak out against social injustice as we became more sophisticated and we went to the universities and we learned some things from others who weren't that concerned, what happened was we produced a genre of, of, of theology that mm -hmm. uh, was minus this concern, but this study guide hopes to be instrumental in renewing it, at least in the minds of those who are able to read it. And we're putting it out to the regional count churches and conferences out here and around the country, but we're hoping it will get to everybody and that it will have a, um, a, 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 a way of creating waves of interest and conversation that will help to turn our church in the right direction, which as I've said, ADRA is already doing and it's Herma Percy, I didn't get her first name, Herma okay. Percy, who has been chosen by ADRA to, to lead that department. In fact, she is putting it together. She's writing all the protocols so you know it's going to be good. Yes, indeed. And she's a part of Brinklow. She's a member of Brinklow, and, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. And I want to give the church kadoos for getting to the place where they're willing to do just that. Well, fantastic, fantastic. I had the opportunity to serve as an associate at Brinklow, and I couldn't be happier to hear that Dr. Percy is stepping up into this role at a, at a pivotal time in our nation's history and in our world's history. Right. Dr. Rock, if I might, uh, this was something that was a robust conversation between Chap Nixon and I before. Um, the category that really draws a lot of our eyes is social justice and the book of Revelation, which is a premier prophetic text uh, in scripture and then by extension for our church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, you, you alluded to the fact that you kind of, from an interpretive standpoint, you, you see things from where you stand. Um, when you come to that interpretive task, you're bound to inform it to some degree by your own experience. And if you are a part of the advantage, that has the tendency to come out. Uh, in your 
estimation, does the study guide specifically now in that third lesson on Revelation, when we kind of think about Revelation out of its 22 chapters, we think a lot about Revelation 14, 6 through 12, the three angels' messages and, and the implications and applications thereof. Does the study guide kind of whet our appetite on an expanded hermeneutic, uh, a kind of expanded interpretive lens that includes more than maybe just one position? What are your thoughts on the study guides pointing towards that? And you can talk about Revelation at large, but also the three angels' messages. Well, I must tell you, I'm not as conversant as I need to be to do a lot of interpreting, but my good friend and our uh, hero down there at Oakwood, Dr. Les Pollard, wrote that week. Okay. And uh, we were glad to see him do it because uh, his dissertation, his dissertation had somewhat to do with this very thing. So I'm looking at some of his weeks right here in front of me, some of his days. And what he did, roughly or broadly speaking, is to connect very well, very closely, what Elijah did in confronting Jezebel and Ahab mm. and accusing them of social injustices, what he did, of course, and uh, declaring that there was a remnant, even though Ahab and Jezebel were doing what they did and there were all these unjust uh, treatments that were going on, he has connected that experience with remnancy mm -hmm. and states that this is where the idea of remnant is, 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 is found right. in the Bible. The first, I believe, he says, place. And uh, he draws on that to say that we, the remnant, have a similar or have a parallel work to do in society today. And is done very, very adroitly and uh, in his own scholarly way. Okay, thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm wondering, Dr. Rock, because I guess one of the things that that we that we as a church have not really zeroed in on is the fact that the Seventh Day Adventist Church came into being, as well as really the whole Millerite movement came into being in this country during the height of slavery. I mean, that was, that was the most um, volatile social issue, not only in America, but in the world. Mm -hmm. And it seems as if our church has never really focused on what impact that issue had on our church being birthed during that time mm. and how that issue shaped our church and shaped its understanding of its prophetic calling and the mission that it saw itself having at that time and how it understood itself and how it understood its calling in presenting the gospel, preaching the gospel and dealing with the issue of slavery when First of all, the Millerite movement rose, and then the Adventist church rose during the 18, early 1860s, moving on, and then following the Civil War, and so on and so forth. And so I'm wondering, is that, is that something that is treated a bit more carefully than the way our church has treated? Our church has almost completely ignored it when we talk about the founding of our church, mm. it's almost as if it, it's almost as if that didn't even exist when our church was founded. Uh, when, when that was, that was a pivotal social issue in this country that, that was going on when our church was founded. Yes. Um, <clears throat> William Miller had his call to ministry in 1831, which was 30 years or so before slavery ended. And wow. he and his colleagues were very, very much opposed to slavery. They, they were abolitionists. And uh, when slavery ended, when the emancipation was issued in 1863, and then the 14th Amendment in 1865, uh, there was a very, very close uh, connection, if not in thought and uh, 
<laughs> in personal conversation, there, there was in society a confluence of events because as slavery ended, the church was beginning. Slavery had its end, the emancipation at least in 63, the 14th Amendment in 65, the Adventist church was formally incorporated or begun in 1865. So as one was ending, the other was beginning. And I have never read, maybe you can help us. And I think you're asking that because I suspect you know something about it, but I've never read where there was a, uh, a conversation that says that the church is beginning. Well, of course, it's with Ellen White and her first vision in 1842, which was 20 years or so before slavery ended, she, she pounded against slavery over and over again. So yeah, the, we, we can draw we can draw from her writings and the writings of her husband and others in the early days of the review, the fact that they were very much against slavery and they were very much against what happened to blacks after slavery ended when 4 million people were thrust out and said, now go on your own and didn't know where to go or what to do. Well, right. And they, they spoke and worked and talked about that. But I've never heard a theological, I've never read or heard a theological discussion that says that the beginnings of the church were in some ways, were in some ways uh, because of a theological concern with slavery, although they were definitely um, abolitionists. Now there is a, there is a, there is a, a a more a more direct a more direct connection between what we became and what we are now that I read around the time of the um, beginning of separate but equal in 1896. Okay, because you see what happened was even though Adventists continued during the 70s and 80s and early 90s to protest against lynchings and the awful ways that the recently freed Blacks had been treated. In 1896, when separate but equal became the law of the land, it became unlawful for Blacks to go to white congregations. And those were the only kind we had in mm. Adventism, except for one or two very small ones down in the South, the work really hadn't burgeoned. And well, there were several that were organized in the eighties, but by 1900, we had but 100 living black Seventh-day Adventists in 1900. Wow. And when those people tried to mix in with white churches, they were rebuffed. And this is where the the, 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 the break happened because as blacks tried to get into the white churches, white Adventists said, no, you can't come in. The law says you can't come in. And it wasn't only what the law said. It was also the fact that white people in their communities wouldn't come to their meetings if black people were sitting there. Hmm. So they said to us, you can't come in. Ellen White had already said, don't do this. Before she went to Australia in the early 90s, she said, don't do this. Blacks and whites should be able to worship together, et cetera. But when she saw what was happening with separate but equal and the law of the land said, you can't go to these schools, you can't get into their churches, you can't go to their hospitals, you can't, you can't, you can't. She said, it's better for the whites and blacks to work for each, each other separately till the Lord shows us a better way. And many of our white scholars and members took that to mean the better way, took that to mean forever. And as I view society, um, it's almost that way. It's almost forever because even today, um, blacks still want to worship where they worship primarily and our white brethren too, and that's all right. So we have that understanding, but it shouldn't be based upon any inhibitions. And that's what we had in the late nineties that began the separation that produced all the angst 
through which we went during the first seven decades, practically, of uh, the 20th century. Mm. So Dr. Rock, you, you spoke um, comprehensively, really, and maybe it was an introduction for some who are kind of having to relearn some things. I think tonight there may be some individual or some individuals who, for the first time, are being challenged with the thought that Ellen White, that Christ, biblically speaking, there is a case that it is a part of the character of God um, to carry forth social justice, which enjoying both equity and equality. Um, I love the language that you use, not just looking from the top down, but Christ looks from down up. Does the, generally speaking, does the study guide kind of help us think through some of the contemporary questions about involvement? So Chap Nixon speaks about slavery and you added to that the, the post-enslavement challenges. I think now we think of environmental issues, uh, of course, racial justice, immigration issues, uh, Black Lives Matter and its tangential movements, economic justice, and we could go on. You know, is the study guide gonna be helpful for us to talk through, think through, pray through how we are to actively engage, respond to the present contemporary challenges that the nation is facing, yeah, even the world? Yes, it does. It does in a very direct way. Okay. And you have to know Pedrito Maynard Reed, and you have to know Hybeth <laughs> Williams. Uh, yeah, you that's have right. To know, you have to know <laughs> Leslie Pollard. Uh huh. And you have to know Ricardo Graham and what he's been through and mm. what he's seen and done. Mm. You have to know these people to know that's the only way they would write. <laughs> that's the only way they would write. Okay. And, and, and it's there, mm -hmm. it's there. And that's, that's another reason. And I want to say this, and I hope this is not offensive, but Dr. Warren and I get nothing <laughs> financial. Uh, the, we, the, these are not being sold with any enrollment to us. We Ooh. do this as a labor of love. We do this as a labor of love. Mm -hmm. uh, I must say that Advent Source has decided to advertise the book Protest and Progress. I didn't ask them to do that, but they're, they're selling that. I'm not. And, yeah. uh, but that's one of the things that they are advertising, or maybe the thing. But uh, these people who've written, wrote from their own experience, from the depths of their heart, and these lessons do exactly what you've said. They arouse interest and they supply perspectives. Wow. And not only do they supply perspectives, but they supply, I hope, we hope, and we pray energy. Yes, sir. Energy to get involved for Black Seventh-day Adventists, if nobody else, to get involved in social justice issues and not be sitting on the sidelines saying, well, it'll all be settled when Jesus comes. <laughs> right. Right. Just hold on. You hold on, or <laughs> it's too big to handle, so we just have to wait. Sure, sure. I'm going believe, to throw it in the chat. We believe that social justice endeavors are constituent with the gospel of Jesus Christ and should be a part of the work done by Seventh-day Adventists. Amen. May I give you just one little personal thrust I did at this. I passed it for nine years to church here in Las Vegas, Abundant Life. I came here to retire, but they asked me to take the church for six months while they found a pastor, and I said I would, and nine years later, I left <laughs> the church. But while I was here, while I was pastoring the church, this is what I did, and it's simple. I said, folk, let's all support the NAACP. Now, who can argue against that? This is all support, and I said, look, we have our we have our 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 financial arrangements in the church into systematic giving, so that we have one pot into which all the money comes, and the board has voted and the church has voted that we will use some of that money to pay fifty percent of your NACP dues every wow. year. Mm. And I think wow. the dues were like forty fifty dollars a year, so we supplemented. Every member who was interested, too bad it wasn't everybody, but a, a, a generous 
uh, segment of them did. We gave the twenty twenty five dollars, and they had to supply the other twenty two, and they were members of the NAACP all year long, mm. and that helped. Now maybe they didn't march, and maybe they didn't go down beating the drums. I I think that would have been all right too, but at least there was something they did. And these people who would never, these NAACP leaders, one or two of them, who would never have come to our church, perhaps for anything else, came in to thank us Mercy. and to tell us what they've been doing. So there are things we as Black Adventists can do and we should be doing. And we hope that this study guide will, um, will give us the impetus to go forward in that direction. Sure, sure. Chap. Yes. Um, uh, um, there's something that I must ask you, and I hope that you won't hope that I'm, I'm not indulging you, but, but you're one of the preeminent educators in our denomination. And I'm wondering your thoughts about some of the recent attacks that have been leveled against um, critical race theory, the 1619 project, and the attempts that have been made to remove them from uh, curriculums in various school districts, in various states, uh, that's going on right now. Uh, what are your thoughts about these attempts? And uh, how do you think we, uh, as, um, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, should relate to this? What, what do you think our posture should be? How should we, how should we respond to this? Well, I, I, I must tell you that cerebrally and emotionally, uh, the critical race theory topic, just the title, uh, makes me want to join in and say, hey, rah, 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 let's do it. But I frankly have not read into it. I've not read enough about it and, and digested it well enough to try to uh, opinionate as such in this forum. I, I, I find it hard to believe that it's anything but good. But then I must say, I don't know for sure. But cerebrally and emotionally, <laughs> I, I, I would wish it is good, and I think it must be. But more generally, not dwelling on that one particular item, more generally, uh, I am very much excited and delighted and um, energized by any effort being made by particularly the Democratic Party and some Republicans perhaps as well, to do better for our people. And I am particularly happy when I hear that the, the historic the black colleges and universities, the HCBUs are being benefited. And when I hear Black Lives Matter explained appropriately, which is that we don't think that other lives don't matter as much we're just saying Black Lives Matter also. Would you please hear us? Black matters marry, ma matter too. We also matter. That's all we're saying. So I think that uh, there are positions we can take which are clearly Christ-like mm -hmm. and that we ought to understand that politics is the way that the secular kingdom which Jesus established. He established, of course, the religious kingdom to which we all belong. Mm -hmm. But he also established the secular kingdom to do a certain work. And the way they do that work is known as politics. Mm -hmm. And it's too bad that there's so much dirty politics, but that doesn't mean all politics is dirty. Mm -hmm. All, all politics involves some social work, but not all social work is involved in dirty politics. Okay. All politics encompasses sociality, but not all social work is dirty politics. And it can be done in a clean and in the Christ-like way with Christian principles in mind. And thank God for our Adventists who are involved in politics now. And I hope we can get more. And the day who have to deal with this will, will be forthright and 
God bless them. Let's pray for them and help them. And our theologians and our academicians, and I don't claim to be stellar in any of those areas. Uh, my work at Vanderbilt was in Christian ethics, and that was a long time ago. So I can only tell you that I'm around today to do a little agitating and uh, to do a little thought provoking, I help, I hope, and to help in that regard. But I'll leave it to some others to do some of these interpretations that you've asked more cleanly. I can only say that in a general sense, I am both cerebrally and emotionally connected to going forward with everything we can do to make things better for the suffering in our communities. Mercy. Dr. Rock, this has been an informative, insightful, and may I even say inspiring conversation. Uh, there have been a cross section of generations represented uh, both on our Facebook live as well as here in the Zoom room. Um, thank you, Chap Nixon, also for being present, for adding so much value and flavor to it. Um, just to give the viewers a, a behind the scenes before we were talking, Dr. Rock was president of, I learned Dr. Rock was president of Oakwood when Chaplain Nixon was there. Yeah, we let him out. We let him out. <laughs> We let him out after four and, hard years. Let well, him. You let him go. You, you, you let him go. There's the picture to prove it, right? Yeah. And uh, Chaplain Nixon was my pastor while I was uh, traversing through that barren land. I mean, barren land up in Barren <laughs> Springs, Michigan. <laughs> and so it's careful, just awesome. careful. <laughs> just awesome to see the lineage here. Um, you come at a certain point pouring into Chap Nixon, pouring into me. I, I, I raise that as we end because I think it's important for you to know that the interest in this subject is not just in one generation, but it spans a number of generations. I, I see some names in the chat here on Zoom and in, and in uh, Facebook. I see Dr. Michael Nixon, Chap Nixon's nephew. I see Dr. Ramona Hyman, who was my teacher. And I could go on names in here that say this topic is really hitting a chord. It pulls on our heartstrings. Uh, I would dare imagine that there are more than just black brothers and sisters who are interested as well. So just as we kind of prepare to drop the landing gear, I wanna offer you this uh, maybe last question. And if Chap Nixon has any more, this penultimate question, perhaps there are those who are watching and as they reflect on their own upbringing, their own nurturing, their own orientation towards the topic, they say, you know, Dr. Rock, Dr. Nixon, Pastor Martin, I am not too familiar with the subject matter by study or practice. What would you say to that individual or that group of persons who are watching, listening, and they're saying, you know what? It is time for us to get into the fight as it were, but don't really know where the on-ramp is. How can they go from study to application and practice? Well, first of all, um, one must familiarize oneself with the facts. And there are a number of good books that help to uh, present them. In fact, I'm glad you mentioned Dr. Hyman. Uh, she is uh, the author of a book that's just been published by Pacific Press, that's which right. has to do with healers in racial issues. And that's what we all should want to be. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important that an individual who may not be thoroughly familiar with the issues or even so much interested, mm -hmm. that individual needs to face the realities of suffering and not drink the Kool-Aid, if I may use a <laughs> phrase that yes. uh, many are putting out there which seems to want to say that things are so much better for us that we don't have to worry anymore. Black Americans don't have to worry anymore. The boundary maintaining mechanisms that have kept us into the separate ethnic group that we are, are still there, though not as legally enforced. They must also realize that it is an absurdity to look at American population, America's population as a melting pot. We are not a melting pot. 
That's what Benjamin Franklin and the rest of them talked about, Thomas Jefferson, all the nations melting in one pot and coming out as, as one homogeneous lot of persons. We are a flower garden in America. Mercy. We must not shy away from the titles African American and Latin American and Asian American or whatever they are. We are different. And science tells us some of us are more susceptible to some diseases than the other. Some of us have better proclivities and interests and talents in one degree or another. And a lot of that is based upon who we are and how we are structured by God. And we should be proud of it. Mm -hmm. We should be proud of it and not deny it and think that we can all suddenly become homogeneous and there's no such thing as, as uh, color. We are a colorblind society. Mm. That's a horrible impediment to progress to people who need a break. And we need a break because equality is not equity when we both start up our engines with our, our tanks full of gas and say we're equal, but one has to start 400 years behind. Have mercy. That's not equality. That's not, it may have equal in the gas tank, but that's not equity. Equity says we need the set asides. Equity says we need whatever government can get us and whatever we can get to bring our people to where their health situation, their physical health, their emotional welfare, their financial welfare continues to be bettered and someday we won't die seven and eight years younger yes, sir. than our counterpart in majority America. Yes, sir. We won't have a longevity rate that's lesser and we won't have some of the other problems in our living conditions, which means that just to be black in America is to be a health hazard. Mm. And it is also to mean that we still have 60 cents. Every time our white brethren make a dollar, we make 60 cents. How are we going to run our church schools on 60% of what our brothers and sisters run theirs? Hmm. And this is what we've got to emphasize the realities of who we are and not blindly drink in what Fox News is telling us and some other people. Yes, sir. Uh, we we got to we got to look at the realities, see who we are, where we are, and say, I, I, number one, I'm going to work to make it better. I'm going to sacrifice to make it better, and I'm a part of the movement. And to all of you who have your PhDs and your Rolls Royce and your big homes and your thick rugs and your deep throated stereos and all of the other things you have. Get out there in the street and work for your people. God has given us this to help each other. Yes, sir. And not to say, well, I got mine, let them get theirs. That's another thing we hope these study guides will emphasize. We're all in the battle for equity for our people. And mm. Jesus said, start at home, start in Jerusalem, start in Jerusalem, and then go out to Judea and the other parts of the earth and not be so concerned with mixing that we forget about the fixing. Our main job is fixing in our communities. So let's fix and next, then let's talk about mixing and that's okay, marry who you want, go to school where you want, do you know, live where you can, that's all well and good. But remember, we have an obligation to start at Jerusalem and then to move out and an obligation to familiarize ourselves with the realities of Black America that make it so much more vulnerable to dangerous diseases and to problems that keep our young people in jail hmm. and that have Black on Black crime, which is worse than white on Black crime in many cities. We've got to face the realities and try to work to do something about it. So again, you said you were letting down the landing gears. I don't want to put them back up again. <laughs> you touched the sensitive nerve, so forgive me. 
no, no, no. Thank you, Dr. Rock. Um, trust me, we, we cherish these opportunities to have these kinds of conversations. And we want you to know, my friends, those who are watching, listening in, we not only appreciate your presence, but we want you to keep your ears to the ground. There will be subsequent conversations in the same thing coming in the future. Our next conversation will address the topic, what pastors need to know about pastoring now, that is in the climate of these times. That's on January 16th. That's a Sunday morning. You want to visit www.drjessewilson.com forward slash pastors to be able to register for that. And again, this is the beginning of an ongoing conversation that we're looking forward to. Dr. Rock, yes, sir, please. I, want, I almost forgot. These study guides, Brad Forbes at Advent Source has created for 99 cents per unit. Yes, sir. That is available until Monday, January 10th, one week from yesterday. 99 cents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, after that, they're going to go up to, I think, $1.59. So our presidents and those who have the information, and if, even if you don't have it, just remember it's adventsource.org, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. And if you will simply go, you can order. It's not a good thing to order one copy because it'll cost you more to, to get it delivered than the 99 cents you paid for it. But order four or five. And pastors, get it for your churches before the 10th because it, after that, the figure is going to go up. So now is the time between now and Monday to get these in your hands. Yes, sir. Both of those links have been placed in Facebook. I should say the link has been placed both in Facebook and on Zoom. I'm getting feedback right now, Dr. Rock. Purchasing, purchases have already been made. Persons are investing in um, the material that has been prayed over and labored over, and we are thankful for it. Uh, Chaplain Nixon, just before we close, any final thoughts, any final comments that you wanted to share? Just, just, just two things. Num number one, we want to thank Dr. Rock for his contribution. And uh, whenever I'm, I'm on with someone like Dr. Rock, I think about the, uh, the treasures that we have in our church. We're losing these treasures. We just lost two important treasures last year, Elder Bradford, Dr. Rogers. And we must do all that we can to get as much as we can while they're still here. Yes. And so we are grateful to have Dr. Rock with us. We have to get all we can from him while he's here. And I wanna to appeal to the next generation. There's still so much more for us to learn about the history of this church that has not been unearthed. And so I wanna challenge those of this generation to do the research, do the study, there's so much more to learn about the early parts of the Adventist church that has not been unearthed. It's there to be there to learn, there to find out. And all it takes is some good uh, scholarship and research to, to learn it and to unearth it, to bring it to, to the surface. There's a whole hermeneutic mm. that we need to make a contribution to from an African-American, an Afro-Asiatic, Afro-Latin perspective that our church has not received that needs to be that needs to be um, contributed to this church, and I want to encourage our our next generation to dare to do that so that our church can continue to progress and move forward. Thank you so much, Chaplain Nixon. Thank you so much, Dr. Rock. Thank you, our viewing congregation audience. We appreciate your time. We're looking forward to seeing you next time, January 16th, what pastors need to know about pastoring now and in future conversations thereafter. Feel free to share this with your friends and your family members. Let's keep the conversation going. And as one scholar said, go on.